My name is Loretta Lyons. I'm the programming librarian here at Guilford Free Library. Uh, we're very happy to welcome you to the first talk in a two-part series with the Witness Stones Project. Uh, tonight our program will feature the story of Guilford, slavery, and the West Indian trade, highlighting items from the book collection of the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center in Hartford. Our guides will be Dennis Culleton, Guilford teacher and co-founder of the Witness Stones Project. He will be joined by Beth Burgess, Collections Manager of the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. Uh, please join us for part two of this series, which will be Tuesday, April 9th, and that will be a book discussion with the co-authors of the book, Complicity, How the North Promoted, Prolonged, and Profited from Slavery. And I do have copies of the book for checkout, and Breakwater Books is also selling the book if you're interested. Uh, and we also have copies of, I have to give a plug for Dennis Culleton's Guilford Papers series, which will also be for sale after the program uh, in the hallway. So before I begin, before I turn it over to Dennis and Beth, I'd like to thank all of our partners in this series. The Witness Stones Project, the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center in Hartford, the Guilford Preservation Alliance, and the Guilford Foundation. Please join me now in welcoming Dennis Culleton and Beth Burgess. Um, thank you, Loretta and uh, Guilford Free Library for this venue today and your continued partnership with the Witness Stones Project. I also want to thank the Witness Stones Committee, whose continued support and vision has allowed us to thrive and grow with, within and beyond Guilford. Uh, raise your hand or stand up if you're part of the Witness Stones uh, Committee. Oh, I see you all the way in the back there, Jonathan. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you, thank you guys. We've been we've done a lot in two years, and it couldn't have happened without so much support. Um, I'd also like to thank the Guilford Preservation Alliance, our co-sponsor today, and our fiscal sponsor for the Witness Stones Committee. I see Shirley here. Thank you for coming. I would like to thank the GFFE, or Guilford Fund for Education, for early funding, Connecticut Hum Humanities for outreach funding, and the Guilford Foundation for funding this two-part series. Uh, so many others have helped us along the way, and I would be remiss if I forgot to thank Tracy Tomaselli, who's here somewhere. Where's Tracy? Yeah, there's Tracy. Hi, Tracy. Uh, for her ongoing research support, I just was talking to her the other day. She goes, just tell me what you need. And, and uh, she now works at the library, which makes so many Guilford residents happy people. Um, Joe Helander for being just a phone call away or an email away from many of our questions. To Brad Lee for providing masonry expertise. Uh, he puts the stones in the ground and digs them up and puts them in again if we, if we ask him to. So uh, we'd like to thank him. And, um, and all of you tonight for coming what I call our twice and thrice told tales. Um, we haven't published information on that, but this, this information is available. And if there's a bunch of books over there where people have dug into this uh, information and, and taken out wonderful things to tell stories about the Beechers and the Foots and other members of that family. But we're looking at it a little bit from a little bit different direction. Uh, when I approached Beth Burgess, from the collections manager from the Stowe Center, about this presentation, I was excited by her excitement. It was a little more than half a decade ago when Beth and I first met on a visit to look at documents I was told were held at the Stowe Center. I was flailing a little, a lot. Uh, it took a lot to learn their filing system, the records they held, and how best to use those resources. Beth was always very patient and informative and, had, and became a good listener as I informally shared my discoveries, surmises, and logical leaps. I've returned on various occasions, usually on school holidays, and each visit has pr proven fruitful. We'll begin our talk today by having <coughs> uh, Beth tell us about the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center's collection and Harriet's family's connection to Guilford. But first, I'm going to, I know you won't all be able to see it, but I'm going to go back to the beginning of the slideshow and I'll show you a little bit of the, um, uh, I have a little bit of an outline, which I think my language arts teachers on the team would be happy about. So really, we're looking at Guilford slavery and the West India trade, how the extent, extraordinary family of Harriet Beecher Stowe benefited from slavery and black servitude. 
So we're going to use the foot collection from the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center, information from East Hampton, New York Public, East Hampton, New York's Public Library Digital Archives, Guilford Preservation Re Records, census data, and family anecdotes. So that's that's where we collected this information from. And in tonight's program, um, it, it, we're going to uh, Beth is going to introduce us to the Stowe family and the Stowe Center's collection. We're going to talk about the Foots Hubbards, Hubbards in the West India trade. We're going to talk about direct slavery uh, for the Foots, the Beechers, and the Hubbards, how they directly um, enslaved or put people in servitude. Um, and then we're going to um, look at uh, the tragedy of slavery and how this slavery tragically befell uh, issues around slavery did harm to the Foote family, certainly not as much as it did to the African Americans who were involved in it, but we can see that, um, unlike our friend John C. Calhoun, not our friend, we don't like John C. Calhoun, but John C. Calhoun, our enemy John C. Calhoun, who said slavery was good for the slave and good for the master, um, we can see it was neither nor, uh, through, through, through the research to this family. And... First, I'd like to thank Dennis again for this opportunity and uh, to the funders of the program, thank you so much for including us. The Stowe Center, uh, where I've worked now for many years, is a place where we like to talk about hard topics. And so this program was a perfect fit for us. So here are the Beechers. <coughs> On the left, the Beechers could be considered the Kennedy family of the 19th century in terms of reputation. Everyone knew who they were. So we start a little um, at that time and then work our way backwards to Guilford. The Beechers were America's most prominent family in the 19th century. The Reverend Lyman Beecher, who's pictured first row center, was the last great Puritan minister and his 11 children were raised with a famous name but no money. Lyman Beecher was warm, smart, and charismatic as a preacher. He was judgmental with passionate opinions. He loved arguing a point of view, and he taught his children to do the same. He, uh, his children were either a part of or had something to say about the many reform movements of the 19th century, from the abolition of American slavery to woman suffrage. He was called the father of more brains than any other man in America. Lyman raised his children to believe they had a place to take in the world a mission to promote Christian morals and influence society for the good. For his seven sons, it was easy to find a platform. They became ministers just like him. Um, for the four daughters, a public life was nearly impossible, but three of them did it anyway, through teaching and writing. Harry Beecher Stowe, of course, became the internationally famous author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, the classic anti-slavery novel first published in 1852. She's pictured front row right most. The book became a runaway bestseller, selling 10,000 copies in the United States in its first week, 300,000 copies in the first year, and in Great Britain, 1.5 million copies in one year. In the 19th century, the only book to outsell Uncle Tom's Cabin was the Bible. More than 160 years after its publication, Uncle Tom's Cabin has been translated into more than 70 languages and is known throughout the, the world. Yeah. At the Stowe Center, our mission is to interpret Harriet Beecher Stowe's Hartford Home and its historic collections, there it is on the bottom right, promote vibrant discussion of her life and work, and inspire commitment to social justice and positive change. Tours of this National Historic Landmark Home and both on-site and off-site programs, like the one we're having now, center around how Stowe came to write Uncle Tom's Cabin. That is, how she learned of and understood American enslavement, what pushed her to speak out against it, and how the legacy of slavery is still with us today. I encourage you all to come and visit the Stowe Center. If you haven't been in a while, now is a perfect time. We just renovated the interior, the first interior renovation since we opened in 1968. So it looks great. Doesn't smell like an old house anymore. It's not great. <laughs> so not only is it preserved for another 50 years of uh, visitors, it's a great uh, way to experience it in a 21st century mode. It includes exhibits and multimedia experiences. 
So how does Stowe, born in Litchfield and died in Hartford, connect to Guilford? The answer, of course, is her mother, Roxana Foot Beecher, and her Foot family. So Roxana's on the left. Was the eldest daughter, sorry, not the eldest, was the daughter of Eli Foot and Roxana Ward, one of their ten children. Upon Eli's early death, which will be discussed further, a bit later, her mother moved the family back to her father's home, Nut Plains, here in Guilford. Um, General Andrew Ward was a Revolutionary War veteran who served, of course, under George Washington. Roxana Foot Beecher was a beauty, well-educated, sweet, gentle, and compliant with an analytic mind. She had a ready taste in literature, so it said, which made her queen among the home-educated local girls. Books and novels, fabrics, mats, and baskets brought back to Guilford through the sea trade commerce expanded her worldview and education. When Lyman Beecher first visited, there he is on the right looking dashing, um, first visited in the plains, he quickly sought out Roxanne as his future companion over her sisters, because Harriet was considered bossy, and Betsy was more worried about her looks. Roxana's Episcopal family, education, and connections were polished to Lyman's rusticity. He was, after all, a blacksmith's son. They were married in 1799 and first set up house in East Hampton, Long Island, where she <coughs> bore six children in her in ten years. Roxana ran a family school with her younger sister Mary and took in boarders to add to Lyman's $400 annual salary, which is pretty low. In choosing the yoke of domesticity, she had little time of her own to read and write. Roxana was absorbed in the needs of a demanding partner, who was often gone ministering for long stretches of time, multiple children, students, boarders, and visitors. The family moved to polished and democratic Litchfield in 1810 when Lyman answered a call to the Congregational Church there. A year later, Roxana gave birth to Harriet. Two years later, to Henry Ward, and lastly Charles in 1815. The first child in a family, Harry Beecher Stowe would later remark, is its poem. The tenth is prose. <laughs> Born seventh and eighth in a lineup of 13 children, the two Beechers who were to become the most famous, Harriet and Henry, had to make a loud clamor in order to be recognized. Besides their elder siblings, Catherine, William, Edward, Mary, and George, the Litchfield household included cousin Betsy Burr, bound servants from East Hampton, Rachel and Zilla Crook, several students from Tapping Reeves Law School, and as many as 11 boarders from Sarah Pierce's Litchfield Female Academy. Roxana's siblings Mary Hubbard and Samuel Foote visited for long stretches, and Lyman's mother and sister Esther Beecher lived close by and constantly visited. So if you're keeping track, that's almost 30 people in that house. <laughs> Catherine Beecher remembered the first five years in Litchfield were a period of unalloyed happiness in which her mother enjoyed perfect health and sympathized thoroughly with Lyman in all of his tastes and employments. But Roxana's domestic reality, however, eventually wore her out and she died of tuberculosis in 1816 at the age of 41. <coughs> Upon her mother's death, Five-year-old Harriet Beecher returned to Nut Plains with Roxana's sister, Harriet. She remembered how Grandmama took me into her lap and cried, and I wondered what made a great grown-up woman cry to see me. Harriet Beecher's associations with Nut Plains and Guilford brought a sense of belonging and connectedness to a mother she had lost. It was a place where her mother wasn't chained to domestic wants and needs. Instead, she was remembered as a well-educated, polished woman and domestic artist. So treasures like this one in the center, this watercolor and embroidery on silk done by Roxana before her marriage, uh, were often pulled out to show her beloved children um, and then put back away, tucked back away as family treasures. <coughs> so later recalled her visits to Guilford in a letter to her sister. I do wish I could have been with you in your pleasant visit at Nut Plains where some of the most joyous days of my childhood were spent. All the things that you mentioned, I have done over and over again when I was a wild, free young girl and never got tired of doing them. She goes on to describe the room in the house, uh, the big sprawling house, 
And then there was the colored woman, Dinah, who was a great friend of mine, and we had many frolics and capers together. She told me lots of stories and made herself very entertaining. Later in life, family visits to Nut Plains continued into um, the generations and after generations. So Stowe's children knew Nut Plains and visited there. The Foote and Beecher cousins often reconnected here in Guilford, Hartford, and elsewhere, maintaining those bonds. Um, so switching pace a little bit, here is the Foot Collection at the Stowe Center. So the Stowe Center not only is a National Historic Landmark Museum and Program Center, but we are also a rather large research collection. Um, for the small uh, to medium-sized museum that we are, it's, it's a little unusual to have a larger library and archives than the museum object collection. And in fact, the library and archives um, eight times doubles what we have in um, objects. And so not only does the archival collection focus on Harriet Beecher Stowe, her works, and those of the Beecher family, their active work within the 19th century reform movements, um, but also early Hartford and Connecticut family history. So to build to that, we collected the Foot Collection beginning in the 1970s uh, and continued through uh, the 1980s. So the collection that Dennis came to look at was this one. And it only looks, of course, like a bunch of boxes here, but inside are treasures, such as at the very left is Eli Foote's uh, coat of arms, so Roxana's father's coat of arms. Um, in the center is, I think, a bill of lading, if I'm not mistaken, from the Eli Foote um, business. And then a 19th century carte de visite of Hattie Hawley, I think that's Emily Wood in the center, and Kate Foote Co. Um, taken in Hilton Head, South Carolina during the Civil War when they were uh, teachers there. So this is a, a, a collection that dates um, from 1772 until 1973 when later descendants were writing about these folks. The extent of it is 10 linear feet um, and it is an eclectic assortment that includes correspondence, accounts, printed material, transcripts, found manuscripts, photographs, drawings, paintings, la la la. So there's a lot. And I would urge you, um, there's a link up above, but if you were to just Google the foot collection at the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center, it will bring you to the Connecticut Archives online, and there's a finding aid there uh, for future reference. So most notably, the documents in this collection relate to the children of Eli and George Augustus and the, their grandchildren, uh, specifically Kate Foot Co., Harriet Foot Hawley, uh, Joseph Roswell Hawley, her husband, uh, and then, of course, Samuel Edmund Foote, Captain Sam Foote, um, John Parsons Foote, and other uh, later uh, descendants of that family. And it was collected, as I mentioned, between 1977 and 1987 by descendants of uh, the Foote family. Okay, thank you. That's great. You're welcome. So when I grow up, when I grow up, I want to get into that room. Because <laughs> right now you, we do it formally as a research library, right. where I put something on a on a sheet, and then Beth goes down and, and gets it and brings it to me, and and I always wonder what the next what's in the next box I, get, I didn't ask for. Give it another time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Maybe if I volunteer up there. Um, so. But it's amazing. It's amazing how much Guilford history is sitting on the shelves in, in Hartford, and, um, and it's wonderful. Um, so what we want to look at today, then, is we want to look at, um, at, at the Foote family and, and their interaction with the, with the West India trade. So we're going to start with that. And this is Eli Foote. So just so we remember again, Eli, and I'm going to, go, I'm going to get a little genealogy here in a little bit, I, and, um, and I, it's okay if you don't follow, because um, my wife been hearing this for years and she doesn't follow. And not, not because she's not, but she's very, very smart, but she just, you know, she glazes over a little and, oh, that's nice to hear. Um, but but uh, on the right we have, uh, so it's evidence of trade with the North, uh, North Carolina and the West Indies. So this is Eli Foote and the Sloop Juno, and, and, he, and he's filling it here in Guilford with stuff. I'm going to get into what the stuff was, but, um, but we're also going to look at uh, Sam Foote, uh, which is, uh, uh, Harriet's mother's brother, Samuel, Captain Samuel Foote, he ended up, he's a very amazing person. 
And then we're going to look at letters from Justin Foote and, and John Hubbard. Now, we, we talked about um, Harriet's um, grandmother. Yeah. Yeah, Harriet's grandmother was, was Roxana, Roxana Foote. But Harriet's great grandmother was um, Diana Ward Hubbard. Mm -hmm. And if you know Guilford at all, the big house on, uh, on, uh, on Broad Street, the uh, Daniel Hubbard house, that's where uh, Diana Hubbard was, was born. She later moved to my house because she married Nathaniel Johnson, um, who was an uh, ancestor to Frankie mm -hmm. Johnson, mm -hmm. who had married Harriet's youngest brother. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> she knows what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> but, um, but the, the point is, is that the Hubbards got involved into the into the Foot family and or the Ward family and then the Foot family. So these these, these families were together. So even a, like a generation or two later, we end up with Justin Foot, uh, who is um, Harriet's Harriet's uh, great uncle, is and Justin and her uncle John Parsons Foot are trading with with uh, Harriet's uh, first cousin, uh, Harriet's mother's uh, first cousin once removed, who was a Harvard. So we're going to get more into that, but just to show you the complexity of it. But and, and for those of you who are, are from Guilford, the, the families are all intermarried. So, so no, no one says, I'm just a Chitton. And if you're a Chitton, then, well, you're a Dudley, then you're a Lead, and you're a Scranton, and Lord knows. Anyway, uh, <laughs> they know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> um, so just to look back here, what we have here, the, the document we have here is a... Um, a portage bill, and what a portage bill is is a is a federal document that if you were a crew member on a ship that was leaving an, an American port to a foreign port, you you had the uh, people got cheated so often that the the owner and the person sending this out had to sign a document with the crew telling them how much they were going to get paid, and then at the end they had to, to go back and, and 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 get paid, and then they had to, the crew had to sign off. So it was really just like a, a, a almost like a, a union contract today saying, okay, these mariners are going to come on your ship, they're going to spend so much time, they're going to get, they're going to get paid a certain amount for the trip, and this guarantees they get paid. Um, one of the interesting parts on this that um, both Beth and I saw, and I'm going to walk over here and try to keep my voice up high, is that this person here, it says Toffee Negra. And, and, and Toffee was a, a descendant of East Guilford um, enslaved family. His real name was Theophilus, and later became Theophilus Niger, N-I-G-E-R. But he was the, uh, his father was Theophilus, and his mother was a woman named Penelope Tantapen. And Tantapen is, a, is an American Indian name. So, so we, know, we know about Toffee and his family. We can follow that family for about six generations. But it's very interesting because it says he was on the ship for 13 days, and he got off on the bottom. If you look closely, he got off, and, and, and it says here, He got off in New York, and then he got paid out there. And, and that kind of made sense because this family, the, the Foot family, did a lot of business out of New York, too. So he might have just been going to New York, but it looks like he served on the crew to New York, and it was planned out ahead of time. So it kind of was in the original document, and it came back later. You can see that he was paid out. So this is just an example of a document that's up in Hartford that talks about what was going on in Guilford. This next document, it talks about um, what were some of the things that Eli Foote was putting on ship. So he was filling this, sh this vessel, the Sloop Juno, with stuff. And on the right side, is, it's called, an, um, it's, it's, it's really, it's, a, it's like a, a bill of lading or a, a, a ship's manifest. But it's really, um, all the people on the right are putting their stuff on consignment on the ship. So he's kind of giving them money up front, usually about half of what, the items are, are worth, and he, when he comes back, he'll give them the rest of it. So he's taking ships, things from Guilford, and shipping it down to the West Indies and, and, and expecting money from that. Um, and, and we can see on the left it says, on this list right here, which is not everything on the ship, there are 13 oxen, 3 horses, 9,200 barrel staves. What were the barrel staves used for in Jamaica and Martinique and, and Guadalupe? To put molasses and sugar in, right? So they're a clear sign that we're trading, uh, trading with the with the slaveholders and the plantation owners there. Um, I think it says uh, 1,950 barrel uh, bushels of oats, 702 hogsheads of beef, one bushel of beans. I guess you know, maybe the beans was for, for the crew. You never know. Um, 6.5 bushels of potatoes. Um, 
two loads of wood and 9.5 gallons of rum, and some of that was set aside for the crew. Um, but we, this, this is, has many more things on it, but this is just a, kind of an excerpt, and, and I'll say to you who were some of the families that were involved in this business. Um, I have John Lee, Simeon Chittenden, Thomas Griswold, uh, Tim Rossiter, Jabez Benton, Silas Benton, um, they just last named Field, but there was a few Fields living here, David Seward, Eli, uh, Elon Lee, Henry Hill, Samuel Elliott, Daniel Stanton, and um, Christian Spencer. So these are some of the names of people who, um, who were trading with Eli Foote, and he was putting together this, he was like putting together this ship's cargo, and it was sailing off to the West Indies. Um, and it was speculation. You know, not every ship came back. You weren't always able to sell everything, but he was, seemed to be making an okay living. Um, previously, he was a lawyer, but because he was an Anglican and then an Episcopalian, um, most of the Episcopalians and Anglicans during the American Revolution sided with the king. They were Tories. And we know that uh, Eli Fult was a Tory, so they say that after the war, he wasn't able to get that legal, place, uh, legal job back. We know he was a trader before he died, and he was a merchant, and he, they lived right about here, like right about where the library is today. So the, the Elliots, and he was friends and neighbors with the Elliot. His son, uh, Sam, married an Elliot, and um, so that was, that was part of what you see. So again, this is sitting in, in, up in Hartford. That's a thing that's always shocking to me, and it's a, it's a handwritten document of all the things that they put on the ship. Um, <clears throat> the next part we have is, is that, um, so we want to get into... Um, the life of Samuel Foote. Samuel Foote was a, um, um, he was one of <coughs> Eli's, he was Eli's youngest son, and there's a lot of information on him. His brother uh, wrote, uh, his brother John Parsons Foote, uh, wrote his memoir soon after he died. I think he died in 1858, but he wrote his memoir. But early on, in the 18, um, starting 1803, this guy started to be a very busy person. So, um, in his memoirs, it talks about the West India trade. And it, and it writes it down just like it was, it was, it was something that people were proud of, and I still hear communities around here that say, oh, we were part of the West India trade, and we understand it, but we don't always understand what they were trading, or who they were trading with, and what they were trading for, and where the profits were made. You know, sugar, and cotton, and things like that. People traded because they could get it cheap, and they could get it cheap because uh, of slave labor. Um, and so people from here, instead of growing sugar beets, filled ships with, cotton, with barrel staves and shipped them to the West Indies because the sugar was cheaper going to the West Indies and getting it because of slavery than it was if you were growing sugar beets here or tapping your maple trees. And those of you from North Guilford know tapping maple trees for sugar isn't really the... not going to ever make a, a million dollars doing that. Um, so, they, uh, they also uh, traded with the southern colonies. Um, they, the fisheries were involved in Boston, you know, you go to Faneuil Hall and there's a big codfish on top. Well, people, why do people in the West Indies eat bacalao? Why do they eat dried codfish, which is from the northern, <laughs> George's Bank, right? Why, why, or the Grand Bank. They, they do it because people in the north could make a boatload of money uh, catching fish, drying the fish, salting it, putting it in barrels, sending it to the West Indies, and that was cheap food for the slaves in the, in the West Indies, and, and that was, and they could trade it for sugar and molasses, and, and additional slaves to bring north. So, so some of the cuisine in, this, in, in, the, in the West Indies today is because people uh, of the tr uh, slave trade and trading with the slaveholders there. Um, so we were sending lumber in form of barrel staves, clapboards. I think there was one record I saw that they put like pretty much a house in pieces on a ship and sent it down to the West Indies. Um, they uh, put beef in the barrel, beef on the hoof. Um, 100,000, I mean, 10,000 horses were sent from Connecticut to the West Indies during this time. 10,000 horses were sent from here. Uh, and different communities were experts at different things. So Weathersfield, I think it was red onions. It was a, red onions in Weathersfield. Different places were, you know, one place was making axes, somebody else was making hoes. So Connecticut had its specialties. And around here it seemed to be barrel stays. Again, if you look... You know, oak, oak, we have enough oak trees still today. Um, and they exchange for sugar, coffee, pimento, and other things like that. So this is what they were talking about, um, you know, a century and a half ago. And the records that we find uh, certainly prove that. 
Um, although he was just a young man, um, at 16 years old, he joined his sister Mary, um, who was 18, who married her first cousin once removed, and joined them uh, in, um, in Jamaica. So his name was John J. Hubbard. He was the son of Bella Hubbard. If you know Guilford or New Haven history, Bella Hubbard was a pretty famous guy. We'll get a little bit more into that. Uh, according to John Parsons, Sam Foote was good with numbers, a quick learner, able to bring his skills he learned back with him. But he goes there at 16 years old and takes a quick lesson in how to do, uh, how to work in a, uh, a, a county house. And, and he brought that back with him. Samuel, Samuel Foote can... Uh, if I speak like this, can you hear me? No. Oh, okay, I'll keep trying this. Just, I, doesn't seem to work continuously, but that's okay. So uh, Sam Foote, um, he becomes a mariner. So when he comes back from the West Indies after a year, he becomes a mariner. He, um, he studied, I mean, he, he works in the mercantile industry, studied math with uh, Nathan Redfield, the navigation with Nathan Redfield. He shipped out the vessels. By 18 years old, he becomes a, a ship's captain. So this guy was a pretty amazing and impressive person, but again, he was making his money and, and uh, like the other foots, uh, going down to the West Indies. Um, so, we have this, John J. Hubbard is a person um, that the Foot family was trading with often in the West Indies. John J. Hubbard married um, Roxanna Foot's sister, Mary. And, um, and I'm going to try to explain. I'll do that. I'll do the genealogy one time. And again, this, you, there's not a quiz at the end of this, so it's okay. You don't get it. So Daniel Hubbard um, lived on Broad Street. He married Diana Ward, who was the daughter of Captain Andrew Ward. He had a daughter named Diana Hubbard, and Di Diana Hubbard was was the sister of Bella Hubbard. But Diana Hubbard married General Andrew Ward. Okay, so. Captain Andrew Ward had a son, and he was Colonel Andrew Ward, and Colonel Andrew Ward had a son who was General Andrew Ward. And the only way I keep track of them is because they each got, there was a Lieutenant Andrew Ward too, but we won't get into that. But, but anyway, uh, Roxana, um, Roxana the Elder, because there was two Roxanas, which just to confuse you more. Um, but Roxana the Elder, her mother married her straight out first cousin. So Andrew Ward and um, Diana Ward Harvard, both had the same grandparents, so that make, that makes you first cousins. Oh, not on the same side, so that makes it creepy. But anyway, um, and they say only the the, um, the Anglicans and the Episcopalians were more apt to marry their cousins, where the where the uh, Congregationalists or the Puritans weren't really into that. Uh, they really forbid it. So Reverend Bella Hubbard, who was the father, um, um, who was John J. Hubbard's father, who married. Uh, Foot married, was the first Anglican preacher in Guilford, and then he moved to uh, New Haven's Trinity Church, and he was the person who helped save the city from the British burning it. So when the British during the Revolutionary War were supposed to come ashore and burn down New Haven, Bella Hubbard stopped them from doing it. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't see it back there. So I'm not, not meaning to talk bad about it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, just look at the British royalty. We're watching, you know, my wife's watching Victoria and, and Elizabeth and all that, so I think it's the same. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but um, he, he, so he was married to Grace Dunbar Hill of Antigua. So just to kind of help us understand, Bella Hubbard, who grew up here in Guilford, was born on Broad Street, um, went to England to get, he had to get reordained in a sense. He had to get ordained as an, an Anglican minister. He ended, up, he ended up marrying someone from the West Indies. Now, if you look at this whole West India trade, people here had brothers and cousins and friends down in the West Indies. So there was a very close, um, close knit, almost community of, of, of New Englanders who had someone in their family down in the West Indies. So that wasn't strange. So Diana Hubbard's Ward's daughter was Roxanna Ward, who married Eli Foote. And Roxana Foote, Justin Foote, and John J. Hubbard are first cousins. So just to help you understand when we talk about this. And I'll, I'll go over this again and again, but again, there's not a quiz. But it just helps us understand how close they were. And, and the story is among the Anglicans because they were the, kind of the ruling class of, of, around the British colonies. And the reason why cousins marry is to keep... The wealth in the family to keep to keep the wealth in the family. So that's that's very very common among 
royalty it's very common among the ruling class here so it's not it's not strange it just is something that um, it isn't as practiced as much today so let me get on to something that you can follow um, <laughs> so here's a letter from John um, John J. Harbert to, to Harry B. or to um, to Eli Foote, Harry B. Just those grandfathers to his his brother and one of his sons. He's writing a letter, and it's all these details. And it tells if you read it, it's a little hard to transcribe. Mm -hmm. But when you read through it, what you really find is that he's 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 the ship goes down to Jamaica, and when the ship gets there, he's the guy trying to sell everything on the ship. So he's writing in very much detail as how many barrel staves he sold in each port. So if he was at um, if he was at Ocho Rio or someplace in different ports, he was talking about how much things he was selling. So again, he's talking about barrel staves and shingles, he's talking about uh, lumber and scantlings, he's talking about herrings and codfish, he's talking about beef and pork, and all the things that they were buying to put back on the ship to send north. And by this time, early on, New Englanders would buy sugar and molasses in the West Indies, bring it north and distill it and, and turn it into rum. By this time, they were making a lot of the rum there, um, which we still get a lot of our rum from the West Indies, um, but and they were bringing it north, so we could we could see that. But at the end, he even talks about listen, I put in uh, some ginger and oranges and grapes, and could you spread, you know, could you give this to my my cousin? Uh, could you give this to John Parsons' wife? And could you give this to my uh, wife Mary, who is not here anymore? So we could see all these different things, but it really helps us understand how the business operated in those days. So, just in, in, in a sense, that's the kind of, you know, um, we're looking at, uh, so that's just showing how part of the family was, was making money. And now we're going to continue to look at um, kind of one of the sad stories we're looking at today is this idea that Eli Foote, who was going on the ships, and he was filling the ships, but <clears throat> this story is about what, what happened to Eli Foote. So, um, first, um, Eli Foote sends a letter to his... Um, first to his wife, um, talking about how he went from Guilford to North Carolina. Now, North Carolina was a place, um, and I think this is how the name Tar Heels come from, is that that was a good place for ship stores. They had a lot of pine trees, so a lot of the tar and the things you needed, uh, tall trees to, to make uh, masks for ships and things like that. So a lot of ship stores came from there. So people from New England would fill their ships, sell some of it in North Carolina, uh, because it was much more sophisticated up here. It was much more, we had, we had more industries up here, and we had more ways to process things, but they would also continue filling the ship and then go to the West Indies and come back. So he talks about um, his family. He talks very, he writes very nicely. And, um, and he's talking about staying with his brother and, um, and, and how he misses the enjoyments of a calm domestic life in New England. So he's writing home to his wife, sharing that, but uh, about a year later, he sends a, a letter home, and he gets stuck down there. Now, northerners didn't want to get stuck down in the Carolinas, because if you weren't used to the diseases there, and you didn't have immunities built, uh, it was a place that they tried to avoid in the summer. But he ended up getting stuck down there because someone broke into the warehouse, the Foots warehouse that was down in, I think, Winton, uh, North, I'm sorry, North Carolina, Winton, North Carolina. So he got stuck there. So he's writing home to his father-in-law saying, I pretty much missed the growing season, the planting season. It's August. Can you take, just check in on my family, take care of my family? And, and the thing that he says at the end that really strikes me, he's, he's, he talks about, um, he promises if he returns, he can afford, he, he returns, he can afford them, his family, his, and he's talking to his father-in-law, decent support, which is the only object of my travels. So a lot of you have had jobs over your life where you're traveling a lot, and you know, you know, traveling's fun, but but if you do it enough, you really would rather be home sometimes. And that's what he's saying. The reason I'm out here, the reason I'm stuck down here, is is to help out my family and to support my family in Guilford. And the only way he can see to support his family is to be a trader because he lost his job as a lawyer and things like that. Um, and that's a that's a, a picture of Ro Roxanne up there. Yeah, by her daughter Roxanne. By her daughter Roxanne. There's about four Hatties, Harrods too, but I'm not going to get to that again. Um, so the the last we we have this this 
thing that shocked me when I was at the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center that, that was, is this, on the left here, you have a fragment of a letter found in Eli Foote's breast pocket when he died in South Carolina before September 8th in 1790. So a month after he sent that letter to his father-in-law, he catches yellow fever, or they call it yellow jaundice, and he's gone like in, in seven days, seven or eight days, he's gone. And he, when he's gone, he's gone with a wife and like, maybe, yeah, ten children, and all of his wealth was based on him getting his money back from that warehouse theft. Because these guys were speculators, they they, they speculated, they, they took out loans, they bartered, they they uh, they pawned things before they went, and with him dying down there, it was done. So it says he uses this very poetic language, and I think it's I think it's from the Bible. It says the silver cord must be loose, or maybe it's 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 like uh, classical. Uh, the silver cord must be loose and the golden bowl broken. Ecclesiastes. Okay, thank you. I think we have a congregational. I think we have a congregational. I think we have a congregational preacher here too. But, um, uh, I and I am destined to be no more to see the object of my only real affection. And this is a, 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 a this is a fragment of his letter that was found. It's now at the Harry Beecher Stowe Center, and it reflects that those he will leave behind. Um, are all in God's hands. He doesn't. He doesn't have anything to give them. He doesn't have an insurance policy. All of his wealth is probably gone with him. Um, and then we have another letter from from his brother Justin Foote saying how he dies of yellow jaundice, which I guess is an oxymoron. But well, we used to call it that too, right? Yeah, kids had yellow jaundice, but we don't call it that anymore. Because jaundice means yellow. But, um, but then he offers emotional but no financial support. So here's his business partner saying, oh, it's so awful, it's so sad. He died, he died real quick, and we'll pray for you. You know, <laughs> thought and prayer, yeah, thought and prayer. <laughs> so these are examples of the Foot family and the Hubbard family in the West India trade, just to show you, and again, we talk about this extraordinary family, family but this was ordinary business. This was ordinary business not only for the people filling the ships, but the people cutting the trees and making the barrel staves and raising the oxen and, 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 and slaughtering them and putting them in the barrels and, and all the different things. So this, was, this was ordinary business. So that's kind of what I was showing there. Not kind of, that's what I was trying to show. So, so slavery direct. This, this is the whole, um, so this is we're saying that they were dealing with slaveholders. Now we're looking at this same family either having slaves or having people in servitude, which was near slavery. And, and this is something, I think the last visit I came up where I, I found the records, this account book of Eli, Eli Foote's account book, and I think it's an Eli Foote, George Augustus yes. Sr. So when people had an account book, it would last for like 100 years. People would just use the same book. They would never throw anything out. And this was a day book, so they just kept writing things. And, and, and I saw this, and it jumped out at me. And, and when I say, you know, I'm looking at like a two or 300-page document written by hand, so not everything jumps out at you. Sometimes your, your eyes just cross. But if you look up here, if, if, could you see this first written area? Well, maybe I'll give you the hint something. But, but you can see the name, and, and the name pops out of me. Right here. It, and the name is, is Cuff. Um, and Cuff is a shortening of the West African name Cuffy, which means a Son born on Friday. And somebody knows a better reason, a better translation. But Kofi Annan, who was the head of the United Nations, that's the same name. It's a West African name, and, and whether it's, I'm not going to go ahead. I, I was thinking the word, I, I, I was thinking Akan, but it's, there's a different variations of it. But a, a lot of enslaved men were named Cuff or Cuffy here. So when I saw the name Cuff, I knew it was an African American. It's an Eli Foote's day book, and I'm thinking, he owns slaves. He, I get, and now I have proof he owns slaves. And then, this is on one side, but on the other side, which was very hard to figure out, and, and Joel Helander helped me figure this out, it looks like he rented Cuff for two years and paid 20 pounds, which is about, I, I have records of slaves being indentured 
for like twelve dollars a year. So ten dollars a year is, is like a reasonable amount if there's any ever reasonable. So it looks like at the top he uh, Eli Foot is renting out Cuff. Well, we should say subletting because earlier on on the other side of this, this is uh, this is Joseph Pynchon's record. We can see that on the bottom line there, it it's, it, it, it hints that he held Cuff for two years and used him to rent out to other people. So, so this is a record. So it doesn't again, it doesn't show ownership, but it shows direct benefit from slavery. Um, this is a little even harder. And it's, it's certainly my interpretation, not, not everybody interprets it the same way, but if you look at the autobiography of Lyman Beecher and you look at what his family did, is when his wife, by the time she had one or two children, she took on five-year-old black children to help her. And, and I couldn't find those documents. I went to East Hampton, my wife said, we're going to East Hampton? So I went to East Hampton, New York, and 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 I found I didn't find their records, but they talk talk openly of of, of uh, taking on Drusilla or Zilla Crook and her sister Rachel. They, the 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 the, the uh, Beechers talked openly about it. But what I could find was their neighbor doing the same thing to a Rachel Cuff um, at the same time. So Rachel Cuff is a, is a daughter of. Um, I can't read it. Uh, uh, Kalo Cuff, which again, the name Cuff is there for a reason. Um, and what it was is an indenture for 13 years. And at the end of the indenture, the girls got 10 pounds in money, which is probably like a, again, at most a like one year salary, uh, a suit of clothes, and they hopefully were taught to read and write. That, that, that's all that they, they got out of that. In, in an indenture, in the, in, and I went back and I looked at the indentures for white children at the same time, and they were all apprentices. And the white kids learned to be cord wainers and, and, and cabinet makers and joiners and, and this and that. But these kids got, at most again, a year's salary and nothing. They were servants. They weren't, they weren't having to be trained in anything um, and, and things like that. So. To me, it was it was very tough to read that, knowing that the Beechers not only I don't know if they purchased them or they took them on, and there might have been a little charity involved that these were really really poor kids, so they were getting you know room and board might have been a really good thing, but it still wasn't the same as if it was a white child. And then the second part of it that we find that Beth said that they brought them to Litchfield. and one of Harriet Beecher Stowe's and Uncle Tom's cabin, like the worst thing that happens is when people took children away from their mothers. Today you can't get from East Hampton to Litchfield. You know, especially if there's any traffic, but imagine in those days how far away, how, is that a week's trip to get from the, uh, Litchfield to East Hampton? And so these kids probably never got back to see their families until they were 18 years old, at which time they had a little cash in their pocket and, and they hopefully learned to read and write, but they might have gotten nothing except for that money if, if they were following the rule. The only thing, and I worked with this with my students this past week, because I wanted them to help me understand what they thought about it. We showed the, 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 uh, the inventions of other people, and what the kids, the kids said, the one thing that jumped out at the kids is, in there it says meat. So they have to feed them and clothe them, and give them something to drink, but they put meat in there. And my, my students are like, why did they put meat in there, Mr. Colton? When you feed people, don't they usually get meat? I said, well, apparently not if... <laughs> Not if you don't require it, they're not going to get fed meat. In other words, they might get gruel for three meals a day or two meals a day. So they had to put meat in so the kids would at least get a little... Because the sad thing is because people didn't own them, they really didn't care. Maybe, I would say they maybe didn't care how healthy they were in adulthood. Whereas if you own somebody and you were going to get their labor for the rest of their lives, you might have treated them a little better. So, And I tried to tell the kids about the... Um, they didn't like it, though. I said, uh, there's, a, there's a saying that I, I'll beat you like a rented mule. And the kids looked at me kind of crazy, and I said, because if you own the mule, you're not going to beat it as hard. And I, and I said, that's what you worry about, that if you give a child to somebody and they're not gonna, it's not going to be theirs at the end, then how well might they treat them? Um, okay. The, so there's other servitude in the family. So uh, this is something from Harry Beecher Stowe's Son, 
I don't quote Edward, but it's Ed, Edward Beecher writes oftentimes. Charles Edward Stowe. Charles Edward Stowe, I get it. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. <laughs> I put Edward. It was Edward in his name somewhere. But I should have put Beecher or I should have put Charles Beecher. But his son Charles Beecher, this, when, the, when the Stowe's and the Beechers had, autobiog had biographies, they were oftentimes interviews and excerpts. So if you look at Elijah Beecher's autobiography, half of it is his children interviewing him. And this was similar to what, what Charles did here, is he interviewed his mother. So, so during those catechisms, uh, this is talking about when Harry's father was a Congregationalist and Harry's mother's family were Episcopalians by this time, because the Anglicans became Episcopalians. And when they got Harriet, they just nailed her with the Episcopalian stuff. It's like, we're going to retrain this kid to make sure she learns the right, the right religion. And later on, I think she converted. She didn't officially. She didn't officially. Yeah. yeah, she so in the later years she went to the kinder, gentler church. Right, but she still church. had a son who was a congregational minister. Did you know how bad those <laughs> congregationalists can be? Oh, <laughs> Says the Catholic. Anyway, um <laughs> So his family, um, during those catechisms, um, Aunt Hattie or Aunt Harriet used to place my little cousin Mary, so this is Harriet Beecher Stowe speaking, and myself bolt upright on her knee while Black Dinah and Harry the Bound Boy were ranged at a respectful distance behind us, for Aunt Harriet always impressed it upon her servants to order themselves lowly and reverently to all their betters. And Harriet was talking about that. Dinah. Dinah, yeah. yeah. And, and they, she was talking about it because she was the seventh or eighth of nine children? So, seven. Seven. Yeah. She was the seventh, and in her own house, she was like, you know, yeah. dinner time, people just walked over her to get to the table or something. She wasn't really treated with respect. But, but here's the person who wrote that book who's saying, she's talking about white privilege. She's talking about white privilege in her own household because she came to Nut Plains after her mother died. And that's why Guilford claims her her entire life. But she was here maybe a year or two. But we love her. But she she lived here, and, and, and that's what she's, she's talking about. And But... And when I saw that for the first time, that's what got me interested in looking at Connecticut slavery. Because if these two people were there, why were they there? Under what conditions were they there? And, and, and I knew nothing about, like, I knew nothing about Connecticut slavery. So this was, this was my entry into Connecticut slavery. This little phrase about, about what Harry Beecher still is talking about. So, this is why, or maybe I just... Not, not really wrong. But according to Elizabeth Fort Jenkins, who is the youngest of Harriet's first cousins, mm -hmm. who was born on or around when Harriet wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, so they were like a generation or almost two apart, she, she claims that uh, Harry and, and, and Dinah, or Dina, were, were slaves, and, they were, and she talks specifically about them being brought by this Uncle Justin. So Uncle Justin, who was a traitor, lived, um, he came to Nut Plains to die. He had consumption or tuberculosis, like many in the family died from. He was separated from his wife in um, Orange County, New York. He left Hattie Foote, uh, Aunt Hattie, $200 annuity, which was a, a lot of money in those days. And, and, and it says in, in Elizabeth's writing, and in, in le left two slaves, Black Dinah and Harry the Bomb Boy. And I went to Orange County to look at the records, and I didn't find that Justin Foote owned slaves, but his wife's family, who he was estranged from, were slaveholders. So, it, so it's, we have a, someone telling us how Harry and, and, and Black Dinah got there. We don't necessarily have the particular evidence, but we do know there were slaveholders there. Uh, he came from a, his, his uh, wife's family were slaveholders. Um, so... And the final part that I want to talk about, so this is this was talent showing us how the Foots and the, and the Hubbards, well, the, the part, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the Hubbards being slaveholders, and, uh, but it's not here in, in, in Connecticut or in, in the United States. So the, the last part, um, and some people attribute this story to some of Harriet's feelings about slavery, the story about her Aunt Mary. Um, so, uh, so Harriet's, Wife, I mean, Harry's mother was kind of the, 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 the pretty, the, you know, the, the, the smart one, and, 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 
and Lyman Beach was a lot of things he liked about her, but Mary was like a queen when, when Lyman Beach was hanging out in the Plains. Um, and, and she was like a really sweet kid, and she was the youngest daughter uh, when Eli Foote died. Uh, the whole family moved to Nut Plains when she was seven years old. So when Eli Foote died, Roxanna Foote and all those kids moved out to be with Grandpa General Andrew Ward and, his, and, um, and Diana. And they moved out to there. And there was a spinning mill there. And there's always stories about the spinning mill where, where Lyman, you know, Lyman and Ben Bartlett came to, came according. And, um, and Harriet had the sharpest wit, maybe too sharp. Um, Mary was the most beautiful but the youngest, and Roxanna was the smartest and the leader of the gang. And so when, uh, when Lyman and, and Roxanna moved to East Hampton, Mary offered to come with them. So he, they came with them, and she helped teach young women. Now, Roxanna and Mary learned about, they learned how to speak French because we also had some West Indian refugees who moved here during the slave, um, the, during the uh, slave revolts in the West Indies. One of them was... Uh, Nicholas Loisel, who lived in the Black House, and another one was Michael Guimar. And I've had, I've seen two things from the Foots. One saying Nicholas Loisel um, taught Roxana French, and somebody else, I think Justin or J John Parsons said Michael Guimar did. But we had a small group of, of, um, of French refugees from uh, Guadeloupe that lived here in Guilford. So, so Mary and Roxanne both knew French. That's why they were able to teach the girls um, and do all those different parts of it. Um, so she moved to East Hampton, and, and I go back to Calhoun here, so I have to be careful. Um, so unlike Calhoun's res or, uh, assertion that the, that slavery was a positive good for all, slavery was evil. Uh, we have you know evidence that slavery was evil for the slave and the slaveholder. So she married John J. Hubbard. Her mother's first cousin, so it was her first cousin once removed, and he was a plantation owner and a uh, slave owner, and he was a merchant in Jamaica. Um, we don't have Mary Foote's letter that she wrote when she was there. Um, it might be somewhere, but you don't have it? I, I don't have it. Um, but the words are shared with us over the centuries by Lyman Beecher, Harry Beecher Stowe, Edward Stowe, I got it right here, uh, Elizabeth Foote Jenkins, and, and others. And they tell of her sorrow and despair. She's, so this is, this is taken from um, Elizabeth Foote Jenkins, she, and it says, she said, Mary said that she often sat at her window in the tropical night and wished that the island might sink in the ocean with all, with all its sin and misery, and that she might sink with it. She had found that her husband was a man of no principle, was unfaithful to her, and among her slaves he had more, uh, one or more mistresses. That was the end with her brother, so her brother Samuel went with her. So after that, she came home with her brother. She left the wreck of everything and came back to the old home in Nut Plains, broken in health and spirit. So Mary was 18 years old when she moved out with a 34-year-old first cousin once removed, successful person from Jamaica, and came back a year later ruined. And that's the only way that the, the family talks about her. Um, so she moved in with the Beechers at East Hampton and helped with the teaching of the children. And then she moved with the Beechers in Litchfield and, became, and again taught there. But this is what she said. All here is the unworried calm of a frog pond. We neither laugh nor cry. So she just, she was, you know, the deep melancholy, the deep depression is what she had sank into. And many people believe that she died of consumption and tuberculosis too. Um, it says, I'm sorry, it says, we need to laugh nor cry, sing nor dance, nor moan nor lament. So she, she got in this deep melancholy and, and really never came out of it and, and died by the age of 28 years old. And the family points to that marriage and that situation, doing that to us, to her. And she died 18, <coughs> she died about the same time Harry was born. Yes. So Harriet remembers her through family stories and anecdotes, but she's written stories, she wrote stories about her, and we believe so much of that inner hatred of slavery that grew in her uh, came from this story of this, the, you know, this lost innocence from this, this person. Okay. 
So, let me make sure I'm the same way. So, I want to get to this idea of harm, the harm that was done. So the devastation of Africans and the communities of Africa to provide labor to sugar plantations is far beyond the harm done to the foots and, and the hubbards and the stoves. But they were human beings, and, 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 and at least sometimes that the people who were involved with trading with the West Indies and things like that, sometimes it affected them, and we hope that that effect kind of brought on to the next generations. When we look at the servitude and the, and the separation of Drusilla and Rachel, the relocation and continued servitude of Harry and, and Dinah, um, we look at the support of slavery in North Carolina with naval stores, we look at the death of Eli Foote and the widowhood of Roxanna Foote, and we can look at Mary Foote Hubbard's last 10 years of physical emotional trauma. trauma. So these are all harm that are done, you know, we, we can't even count. I, Somewhere there's a statistic that says more Africans were brought to the West Indies, those small islands in the West Indies, than were brought to the rest of North America. And because of the harsh conditions there, they, instead of keeping the slaves healthy enough to reproduce, they just replaced them. And, at least, you know, so that's how awful it was there. So we can't, you know, and that was for, mostly for sugar. That's, that's, that's what that, that was about. But... We have, so we have this extraordinary family um, who seems completely out of order, so sorry about that. Um, but we can see the West Indian trade and all the people involved. We can see the slavery and black servitude um, and all the people involved there, some of the same names. We, um, we can look at the house that's still here in, in Gilbert today by the footbridge was purchased by, by Justin... I'm sorry, Justin. It was purchased by um, John P. Foote and Sam Foote. He gave that money to George Augustus Foote Jr. to purchase the house that's still there. And that's the house that Harriet came to after her mother died. That house was built in 1810. But we also have, if you look at the Hubbard family, not only did John J. Hubbard own dozens of slaves, we know Levi Hubbard, who lived in the black house, uh, owned Aaron, who was uh, Candace and Moses and and uh, Pompey's uh, brother. We know that Bella Hubbard, Jr., went to Louisiana and became a major slaveholder and I think a judge down there. So he, he went down to Louisiana to do that. So this family continued to, to do this and looking at, you know, how, in a sense, how much money you could make. Um, and so the big question then becomes, this idea of how do we get from this uh, family benefiting from slavery to these abolitionists that we, we celebrate often and, and uh, as we should. We know that Ed Edward Beecher is the first one to really write extensively about, um, about um, the abolitionist movement because his friend was, was murdered. Elijah Lovejoy. Elijah Lovejoy was murdered in... Yeah, and in Alton, Illinois. Thank you. And he was murdered there, and Edward kind of wakes up one day and says, this is the worst thing ever. So he writes a book, and it was probably one of the first treatises from that family against slavery. Then we have Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, who was you know, recently a Pulitzer Prize winning yeah, Debbie Applegate. Applegate here, uh, most famous man in America, starts preaching uh, against slavery, and preaches early and often. He, he was crazy about that. He was down in uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights, which was the premier, you know, that's where all the, that's where all the fancy people lived, and he was there with his church. He was buying rifles and sending them out to Kansas. He was auctioning um, slaves so he could purchase slaves and give them their freedom. Uh, he was both a showman and, and, uh, and, a, and a preacher. As they all are. No, I'm um, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> but he, he got people riled up and, and got people uh, involved with it. And then Harriet Beecher Stowe writes Uncle Tom's Cabin. And, and we all know that's, you know, um, Lincoln supposed is attributed to Lincoln. She's a little lady who, who started this great war. Um, that question there, I don't know the answer. So maybe one of the younger people, or if you have a, a, a grandkid or a kid going to, uh, going to um, university and they need a doctoral thesis, 
That's the one. How did that one generation, you know, go from a generation of people who benefited from slavery without even thinking about it to turning and, and believing that slavery was wrong? And not only believing slavery is wrong, but risking really everything they had to say that because you could get, like Elijah Lovejoy, you could get lynched for, for trying to free slaves. Can I make that? Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with what's going on in the culture at the time. Uh, at the time Edward Beecher experiences the death of his friend Lovejoy, um, you start to see in the Beecher family letters, which are these enormous letters, they're called circular letters, where one person starts it and it is uh, continued by the next person, mailed on to the next sibling who adds another section. It's like a forwarded email. Um, in that discussion, in that discussion, you start to see well, what do you think about what happened to Lovejoy, and what do you think about slavery? Um, so these people who grew up with enslaved, indentured, is basically enslavement, in, indentured people in their home and understanding that it's a part of normal life, all of a sudden they, they see what's really happening and, and what it means for them to continue to live this life. Uh, there's a great discussion in uh, Stowe's Pulitzer Prize-winning um, biographer, uh, Joan Hedrick, who is my Bible? I'll look, yeah, right over there. Um, 1994. Um, she does a great. I think she's spoken here too. I think John, yeah, John yeah. King's. So she does a great discussion about racism within indentured servants um, and how Stowe's early marriage and her life out in Cincinnati with her husband Calvin. She is hiring um, people of color, women of color, to work in her kitchen. And she ranks them at the lowest of her um, servants. They're, they're not considered help. They're considered servants. Um, so it's not really um, up to, to, right? So there's, there's racism here is what I'm trying to get at. And their privilege is, is seeing this and changing through uh, the time. So by the time Henry Ward Beecher becomes so famous as that uh, Congregational miniature, uh, Minister at Plymouth Congregational Church in Brooklyn, he has these faux um, slave auctions where he actually brings light-colored children, uh, as you see there in that famous painting, um, who will redeem her and people within the congregation by her freedom. So that in and of itself is showing privilege and, and um, racism. Um, but it's for, as they see it, the end, the greater good. And then, of course, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the first edition over there on the left-hand side, um, is layered in, in, in privilege and racism as well. Uh, so we look at it from a 21st century lens today, which is a huge part of what we're doing right now, um, and things that, that would have been commonplace to them then. Uh, and again, I would point you towards uh, John Hedrick's discussion of this for further reading. Thank you. So, what I, what I did is, in, you know, kind of coming back now to the to Guilford folks, um, these are three children of, of George Augustus Foote, who is um, Roxanna's Foote, the youngest brother. And they, they grew up here in Mount Plains, and, and they, um, and Tracy says he's not the first person from Guilford, but George Augustus Foote, Jr., was one of the first people from Guilford to join the Civil War effort, and he did it because he wanted to end slavery. That was his focus. So we have George Augustus Foote, Jr. He was one of the first to join, and he was one of the last to die of injuries from the war. Um, on the right, we have Hattie, or Harriet, Ward Foote, so we get most of the names in there, Holly. She married Joe Holly, who was an abolitionist. They lived up by uh, a nook farm in Hartford, uh, by what, and there is Isabel uh, Beecher Booker and others, and she ended up in the war, the Civil War. She was married to uh, Colonel and General Hawley, and she ended up working. She was running a hospital ward in Washington, D.C. She taught children to read and, and free blast to read, and then she was in Wilmington, North Carolina, when the Andersonville prisoners were brought there. Um, and if you ever saw the pictures of the Andersonville prison, it, it was a, it looks like you're looking at Holocaust pictures, and these men were, they had to keep them from eating too quickly, or they would die, and all these, all these stories. And, and then 
but she she in a sense went down there and, and did as much as she could. And on the left is her little sister Kate Foot, who ended up marrying uh, Judge Coe. But she was I, I don't think too old at all. I think she was a teenager and she was teaching down south during the during the Civil War too. So the same family, you know, again uh, the Foots who George Augustus uh, on the eighteen twenty census shows him holding two black servants in his household. That same family is 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 and again risking themselves and going down to a war zone. And George Augustus was uh, meritoriously promoted all the way to lieutenant. And there's great stories about him. The library holds his Civil War letters that we get copies from the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. But so again, we get to this family. We see the next generation, the amazing things they're doing. And um, but you know, for me. Um, it, it is such an interesting story, and, and I really, um, we're so blessed that the Foote family uh, donated these documents and many of them to the Harry Beecher Stowe Center, and they're kept lovingly, and they keep me out of the room where they're held, <laughs> so they kept they kept secure. Uh, but and we do appreciate, you know, certainly uh, their participation tonight, but their continued participation. If you're interested in getting into discussions about hard things that are going on and, and talking to people who are seeing things from a different perspective, uh, that's one of the great places to go there. We also have a great program here. Um, can you help me, Loretta? The program with, with Dr. Um, Donna Daniels and writing yeah, Writing and Justice. We have a great program here about looking at modern issues around slavery. I mean, slavery about about uh, color and race and inclusion and things like that. But um, with, with all that privilege, we can see that what, how we all evolved, how our communities evolved, how how we still benefit from from the um, from the results of that. If you look at our churches and our big buildings and our greens, and uh, but I think that the um, the, 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 the best thing is that we have people today looking to try to make change and, and continuing to do that. A um, little advertisement for our second part of this. They have some books that you can rent out if you want to look at Complicity. Complicity tells the Connecticut story of what we just talked about go through today. It's a fantastic book. If you haven't read it, if you have read it and you haven't read it in 10 years, read it again and come back on the 9th, and we'd love to uh, have you interact with the, with the people there. So we have a few minutes for questions, and I know some people probably, I don't know, we got kids, kids here, we have to go to school. But anyway, people need to leave, please do, but otherwise we're happy to have people ask questions and if we can help out. Yes. Yes, um, there's a book, um, I don't recall the author's name, but it's called um, Slavery and Justice, and it talks about the history of It's just, you know where exit 59 is? If you're going exit 59 and you turn, if you're coming from here and you take the left there on Goose Lane, where that hits um, like Tanner Marsh, that's that's called Nut Plains. And East River Preserve, there's a Nut Plains, uh, a footbridge area, named with foot with an E. And, it's, and for them, it was their mythological family homestead. Isabella Feature Hooker talks about it like she grew up there, and her mother wasn't Roxanna Foot. She had a different mother, but she talks about Nut Plains as her, where her family is from, and where she believes was the um, uh, prototypical New England um, pastoral place along the East River. And um, if you go there today and go for a hike, you can see the General Ward Cemetery that's there, and a lot of the names that you saw. 
those people, folks are buried there, and that's all town property today. Yes. From the where the congregational churches? Yeah. Well, until they moved it, we called it the Benton Beecher House because uh, it was owned by Lot Benton, who was Lyman, when Lyman Beecher was a little boy, his mother died. Catherine died, and he was so young that they sent him to Guilford with, with his uncle Lot and aunt. Uh, aunt, but her her last name was Lyman, and that's why like Lyman from Durham and Middlefield Lyman's. And he was sent there, and uh, so but anyway, to make a long story short, when Lyman, when Lot Benton's wife died, he moved to the house where the Congregational Church is, and by that time, Lyman was gone. So if Lyman ever stepped foot in that house, I would have been surprised. If Harriet ever knew about the house, I would have been shocked. I'd be shocked. So when they, they moved the house from here down to there, because the Congregational is some, some um, president of Yale, <coughs> traveling around, and you get upset because the people in Guilford's Green... The cows were pooping on the gravestones, and it was a mess, and there was a dump there, and there was all these other things. He said, they got this beautiful place for a park in the center of your town, and instead, um, cows were pooping on the, on the gravestones. So they moved two churches off. One is the um, Episcopal Church was moved, it was, was torn down and sold for lumber, and they built this beautiful stone edifice down here. And then they took the house, and they... Attach it to either 70 oxen or 70 pair of oxen. There's still an argument, and Edith Nettleton and I argued about this. <laughs> Edith Nettleton was our librarian here, oh. and she worked here for 40 years, retired, and volunteered here for 40 more years. So, 104 years old, she heard me on TV one day, and she calls me up, Dennis, I think you're wrong. But, so anyway, she thinks it was 70 oxen, but I have, I have documentation it was 70 pair of oxen. Anyway, they pulled the house down there, and they said Mrs. Parmley was in the house making candles, and she wasn't going to stop. So she kept dipping her candles while they were pulling it down. So recently, when people were arguing about who should be in the uh, Benton Beecher house, the people who own the house now named it the Harriet Beecher Stowe house, and we don't think she ever stepped foot in it. So... That's my that's my story and I'm sticking with it. Yeah. Yes. This were these Hubbards the same Hubbards that were like then in Meriden and Middletown? There are so many Hubbards. Um, and there are Daniel Hubbards everywhere. But this Daniel Hubbard was the son of a Daniel Hubbard and I think he had a Daniel Hubbard son and he might have been the grandson. There's like three Daniel Hubbard houses like right around Broad Street. So I pretty much lost track. Uh, but I know Daniel Hubbard's wife, Diana Ward Hubbard moved into my house because he, she married um, Nathaniel Johnson, whose brother was Samuel Johnson, who converted to become an Anglican and, and sent Bella Hubbard to, to London to get ordained. And that all has to do with... Pay, I don't know, what, what's it called? It's, it all has to do with the... With whose, what are, what's the term for the, whose, um, who, apostolic succession. All has to do with apostolic succession. And, and Samuel, what, who ended up, I mean, Samuel Johnson, who ended up finding, finally Columbia University, he, he got in and said that he wasn't, he wasn't ordained by a bishop, so he wasn't valid anymore, so he was the first one to go back to England. And, uh, and he's from Guilford, too. Thank you yeah. so much. of the slavery in the West Indies. Yeah. Like, American slave owners, as a way of enforcing discipline with their slaves, would threaten to send them to the West Indies. The life expectancy of the enslaved people that were in the West Indies was much uh, smaller than in the, in the U.S. And yeah. it, it was known as a very brutal place. In fact, George Washington sent one of his uh, slaves over there, somebody who had tried to run away or done something that was... Uh, yeah. yeah, so that, that was yeah, considered I, the worst possible place you could possibly be. Yeah, and, I, and I, you're right, you, I, you can't emphasize it enough, and, and, but I appreciate you doing emphasizing it because 
Um, even the Pequot Indians, after the Pequot War, many of them were sent down there um, because as punishment. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I agree with that. The sugar plantations were known as the most lethal places to send slaves. The life expectancy, I think, was seven years. Uh, and when you made the comment about uh, you treat uh, a mule that you own better than you would treat a rented one, I don't think that's quite accurate because what they did in those days, the same thing they did with the slaves, was if you if a slave died, you just bought another one. So you didn't have to, it was cheaper, it was cheaper for them to uh, replace the slave than to feed them adequately. And a lot of the stuff that they were setting down was to get, was in, uh, enabling slavery because the plantation owners then didn't have to waste any land growing food for the slaves. Mm -hmm. It was cheaper yeah. to import it from New England yeah. Yeah. than to grow it and, and give up uh, sugar yeah. cultivation yeah. instead. Yeah, yeah. That and that's a way of saying it. Every square inch they wanted to grow sugar on, yeah. so they would... It, it, it blows my mind that people are fishing off of Nova Scotia to catch codfish, and when I go to the Caribbean, I'm eating the fish that's, <laughs> that they catch there. And why would you do that? Because you don't want to waste any time or energy or any people to go fishing if you could make sugar. And, 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 I, and I agree with that. I will say that in, the Amer in America, people did, you know, for monetary reasons, did, especially after 1808, um, uh, bread, you know, they... they, they Bread, they kept surplus slaves to sell to other to further south. So they characterized Virginia yeah. as uh, after that uh, eighteen oh eight. Yeah, that it was basically they kept slaves to breed them and sell them south. Yeah. So so there was a difference between here and there. So I, I agree with what was going on there, but in the north it was it was different. Um, a lot of in interesting stuff. Yes. Um, another book I'd like to recommend. It's called Disowning Slavery. Yes. Uh, written yes. by a, a, a woman by the name of Joan Mellish, yep. yeah. which goes into great detail about how New England uh, systematically <laughs> sort of erased from its historical consciousness that um, uh, in the mid-1700s, in southern New England, roughly one out of every three households owned a slave. Right. Um, and so, uh, coming back to your your comment or question about the difference between you know the, the slaves and the and the uh, foot household and what happened later, I think it speaks to the prevalence yep. of of um, of slavery in New England households mm -hmm. during that period. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and one of the things that uh, Joan Mellish goes into great and excruciating detail about was the very painful period of gradual emancipation. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that, uh, and, and what Beth referred to as indenture, being indentured, being the same as slaves, at, at a certain point if you were born as a slave or as an enslaved person, when you were 18, you'd be free. Uh, your parents might never be free. And so, so there was this long period. Of, yeah, and, and I was telling, in Guilford in 1820, Guilford and Madison, when there was no record of slaves in the census, still half of the African... Americans were living in white households, and what does that tell you about their relationship? So the relationships with their white, so instead of having a, a slave master, if you're an indentured servant, it's still you're you're, you're the person who's in charge of. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um. You know, during that time of the 1840s and maybe even before, there also was a very active revival of the Irish movement, anti-slavery, but it was also led um, by black freedmen free as well, mm -hmm. and escaped slaves. Mm -hmm. So Frederick Douglass, right. he didn't just pop up in the Civil War. No, He'd no. been very actively engaged in it during that time. And you know, you talk about the transformation of the features and the foots and all that. Suddenly, they became abolitionists. What I'm curious to, to know more about is how were they influenced by these black abolitionists who were really incredible. It wasn't just Frederick Douglass, but it was no. other, yeah. other black men, men and women. Yeah, there's another book I'm reading, and I can't remember the author. It's about how runaway slaves really set the table for the Civil War because the Northerners were angry that the Southerners were making them return them, and the Southerners were angry because the Northerners weren't happily returning them. So it's like this, this, this back and forth. But um, I think so much of our research has been about, you know, 
we in Connecticut are fantastic. That's where Harriet Beecher Stowe and John Brown and all these wonderful people. But there's a church right over here of the people who were kind of kicked out of the big church because they were abolitionists. So that, that church, the Christian Scientist Church, which no longer has a steeple, were, were members of the, of the first congregational church who had to leave because the first congregationalists didn't want them um, having bringing in abolitionists. So right here in Guilford, I would say before the war, probably much more than half of the people were anti-abolitionists or really could give a heck about ending slavery. But the, what your point about the African American being part of it, the new scholarship is rising quickly with people finding information, and there's um, a great little center in uh, North, I mean in Northampton about, and I can't Ruggles, the Ruggles Center, and talk, telling that story that you're telling. So thank you for bringing that up because we don't have all the books about that because it's just coming from the survey. We spent the last 150 years. You know, thank how, how nice of a job we've done. Other questions? Okay, please come on the 9th of April, and we'll have the authors of Complicity.